now to have a look at the type in the book of Judges of the redemption of Israel uh, from their dispersion and, of course, from their ungodliness. And the Redeemer is shortly going to come to Zion, brothers and sisters, to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And we are going to share in that work if we are blessed to be there beside him in that day. And so this type of Jephthah is going to be very important to us from that uh, regard alone. We're going to see the, the magnificent way in which the Spirit presents Jephthah as the rejected deliverer of a people who do not really deserve deliverance, but they are given it by God through this one. Now, we read in Judges chapter 10 and at verse 6 that Israel goes through its fifth major apostasy. Five, of course, is normally the number of grace. But grace is not evident here. And I want to show you that there is a peculiarity in this particular apostasy that doesn't occur in the others. Every time in the previous events of the book of Judges that Israel has called out to their God, he has raised up for them a deliverer almost immediately. It doesn't happen here. And there's something quite unusual that happens here. And we need to grasp this because it's very important in relation to the type. Verse 6 tells us, The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of Yahweh and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria, of Zidon, of Moab, of Ammon, and the Philistines. And they forsook Yahweh and served not him. As Rotherham puts it, they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. There was a multiplicity of deities that... The, the, became the object of their worship. Male and female deities, and one hardly needs to spell out what that means in terms of behaviour. So they borrowed gods of the surrounding nations. And that, of course, when you look at the history of the Jewish people from AD 70 onwards, is very much what they have done. They have become, of course, their gods are mainly wealth and possessions and money, etc., but they have become people who shift here and there, borrowing from the nations amongst whom they are scattered. In verse 7 we read that the anger of Yahweh was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and in the hands of the children of Ammon. So now they've got a problem. Now I believe in the type that the Philistines represent the Palestinians because of course Palestinian comes from Philistine. That's how you get the name Palestinian. And here Ammon represents Gog. Ammon's name means tribal, a people as a congregated unit. And of course, Gog is going to put together a confederacy of peoples to come down upon the land of Israel. And in chapter 11, we see that Ammon actually invades the land. And we're going to see that type unfold. In verse 8, we read that they're punished for 18 years. And that year, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. Uh, and all the children of Israel on the other side of Jordan and the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So the problem was mainly over on the eastern side of the country, on the eastern side of Jordan. Now 18 is twice 9, and 9 being the number of judgment in the Bible, here is a double judgment, you might say. I will punish you double for your sins, Isaiah 40, verse 2. So here were God's people who chose their gods from the surrounding nations and turned their back on Yahweh, the great covenant God of Israel. What was he going to do? Well, we're going to see something quite remarkable that God does here that he doesn't do anywhere else in the book of Judges. He actually hides his face from Israel. And that's the message of Judges 10 verses 10 to 14. We read this in verse 10. And the children of Israel cried unto Yahweh, saying, We have sinned against thee both, because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. Now what would normally be the response of a confession like that? Well, God would respond kindly and graciously, would he not? He doesn't do so. Have a look what happens in verse 11. And Yahweh said unto the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and the children of Ammon? And the Philistines, the Zidonians, the Amalekites, and the Mayanites did oppress you, and you cried unto me, and I delivered you out of their hand. He reminds them that every time they cried to him, he had delivered them out of the hand of their enemies. But not this time. So what's changed here? 
Verse 13, he says, Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Is this the God that we know, brothers and sisters? Is this the God that you and I know? Does he not normally turn when people come and confess their sins and show kindness and grace and mercy to them? Of course he does. So what is happening here? Well, you see, it's all due to the type. Because through the long history of God's people since AD 70, they have continuously turned their back on him. And he told them in Deuteronomy 28 what was going to happen to them. There would be a Roman oppression. Then there would be a long period of hideous oppression. And it would culminate in the, in the events of the Holocaust of the Second World War. He told them all that. You know what happened in the Second World War when Jews were crammed into concentration camps and into ghettos like the one uh, in Poland, in Warsaw? You know what they did? They, they cried out to God. They pleaded with him every day. They were saying things like Deuteronomy 28 said they would say. Would God that were morning. And when the morning came, would God that were evening. And they cried out for help. And there was no answer. And most of them concluded that there can't be a God. There can't be a God. And it was they who went to the land and through them God formed the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel did not come about through religious Jews. Do you know that religious Jews were actually opposed to the establishment of the state of Israel? It was not religious Jews that formed the state of Israel. Their own rabbis will tell you that. It was the atheistic Jews who were used by God to establish the nation of Israel. That's why they are a secular people today. That's why they're very atheistic, most of them. There are a few religious, but most of them are not. In fact, Tel Aviv has become the centre of the most hideous practices of the last day. It's become a centre of sodomy, the problem that God destroyed in the days of Lot. So that's the nation today. You know, the day is going to come when God will come down upon them that they're going to cry out again. And God will provide for them a hidden redeemer, one whom they rejected and kicked out of their land. And that's where Jephthah comes into the story because he's a wonderful type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, God has a redeemer ready for Israel, doesn't he? He's at his right hand right now, but the time hasn't come for him to appear. They're not desperate enough yet. But that's what happens here as you read on. They become extremely desperate. So there's a confession and plea for help and an unusual thing happens. Why? Well, here's the principle, brothers and sisters. It's in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. This is verse 2 on the screen. God says to Israel, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear and if you go to Ezekiel chapter 39, you get a summary of the history of his people. And you know, three times at the end of Ezekiel 39, we read these words. I have hidden my face from them. And God is hiding his face from Israel today because of their behaviour. But he has already prepared a deliverer, just like here in Judges 10 and 11. He's already got a deliverer prepared. But it's not one that they expect. It's not one that they really want. It's the one that their fathers crucified and rejected. It's a marvellous, absolutely marvellous type of the latter day restoration of God's people both in the land, as we're going to see in an exhortation this morning, outside the land. So let's pursue this, brothers and sisters. Verse 16 of Judges chapter 10 tells us, And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served Yahweh, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. But there's no answer. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and the princes of Gilead said one to another, 
What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. They were in absolute desperate straits. Now normally, genuine repentance, which by the way is not easy, and it's really universal, genuine repentance will always meet with a response from our God. We have the classic case of David. He held on to his sin for more than nine months. And when Nathan's parable unraveled him, he said, I've sinned. And before he could even get the words out of his mouth, Yahweh said, through Nathan, your sin's forgiven. That's the way our God operates. With you and me, who have a covenant with him. But he doesn't operate that way here. You've got a people crying out for deliverance and he leaves them to boil in their own juice. You go and call upon the gods that you're serving or have been serving. You see, that's exactly what will happen to God's people until finally, in their desperation, the Redeemer comes to Zion to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And when that Redeemer comes, he won't be alone. He will have some of us with him. Because when Jephthah comes back to deliver Israel from the hand of the oppressor who represents Gog in the type, he's in company. He's in company with his brethren. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ will have company in that day. So in verse 18 there is silence from God. And so Israel turned to human, a human redeemer. Where's the man? And that word man that you read in verse 18 is, is Ish. Where's the great man that will redeem us? Well, Yahweh had prepared just that man, the great man, who in the next chapter we find, when we read his story, has been kicked out by his own people from his inheritance. So Jephthah is a type of Christ as the redeemer of latter-day Israel. So let's meet him, shall we? In Judges chapter 11 and verse 1. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valour, and he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. His name means he will open. Jesenius says his name means whom or what God sets free. And really it epitomises the work that he will perform as Israel's deliverer and as a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here is the one who's going to bring deliverance. He's described as a mighty man of valour. Gibor Kail are the Hebrew words, a powerful warrior of strength. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ is described in Isaiah 9 verse 6, a mighty warrior, a Gibor. So, the, so that this man is setting forth a type of the great redeemer of Israel. And the right of the firstborn, however, is rejected because when you read in verse 2, Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Now that word strange there means someone from a different race, an inhabitant of a different country. So when you read in verse 1 that Jephthah's father had this woman, she's called a harlot, who produced for him... Jephthah, then he married and had another family as those other children those other sons grew up, they said to Jephthah, you're a foreigner you don't belong here we don't want you now the law of Moses was very clear about this the right of the firstborn was that if you had a non-preferred wife in Deuteronomy 21 verses 15 to 17 and she bore you uh, the, your firstborn you had to give him the right of the firstborn. You could not displace him because the wife who produced him was not preferred. He had to be the firstborn. The law was very clear about that. So they didn't keep that law. They rejected him. And they kicked him out. And in verse 3 we read that then Jephthah fled. He fled from his brethren and dwelled in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. In the land of Tob, Tob means good. So he went to the land of goodness. Now get the picture. 
When our Lord Jesus Christ was rejected by his brethren and they crucified him, where did he go next? Well, he went to the land of goodness. He went to the right hand of Almighty God. There's no better land of goodness than that. So that's where he went. And he gathered unto him vain men. Now when we use this word vain, we tend to have a negative connotation. We think of vain as something, you know, that's, that's bad. Well, not necessarily. The Hebrew word wreck simply means empty. They're not necessarily evil men, they're empty men. A bit like the men who came to David who had all sorts of problems. Their life was empty and David filled it up for them. And so did Jephthah. So, brothers and sisters, is there anyone here who would be prepared to say that when you were called to the truth, but you didn't come empty? It was because you felt empty that you came to the truth, wasn't it? It's because you could see absolutely nothing that the world or the flesh could offer you that was worth anything in comparison to what the truth offered you. We all came to our Lord Jesus Christ empty and he's filled us up. That's the principle here. Now Jephthah, of course, was an upright man. He would not have sought the company nor maintained the company of evil and corrupt men. We're going to see he was an upright man in a moment. So here is his standing. Now, over the years, and I've been working on the life of Jephthah for something like 30 years, over the years I've read many things and I've heard many things about Jephthah. Everybody's got an opinion about him and most of them are not based upon what you actually read. It's what we, our impressions, what we think. Well, I'm not interested in what people think. I'm only interested in what the Bible says. And even if it doesn't sit that well with me, I don't care. If the Bible says it, then I'm happy to accept it. You know, every time I read the story of Jephthah and his daughter, I sort of get tingling up my spine. And I think, oh, could I have done It really affects me emotionally. But you've got to get rid of emotion. You've got to have a look at what the Bible says. And when you grasp what it says, and you get the facts straight, then it's a magnificent type of what we will shortly see in the earth. I've seen him accused of ambition, especially of rashness, worldliness, come on, worldliness in the sense of offering human sacrifice. All right? I've heard all of those things. But these are the facts. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, we're not going to go there for time's sake, we are told that Yahweh sent him. He was sent by God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, Paul lists him in the honour roll of faith. Time, he says, would fail me to speak of Jephthah. He was amongst the faithful. And scripture is absolutely silent about his failings. Like all men, he had failings, but you will not read about them in the record of Judges chapter 11 and 12. So when you look at the facts, they're pretty simple. Here is a man of God. He's an upright man. And what he does is absolutely staggering, as you're going to see. In fact, you'll be humbled when you see what this man does when he makes a vow. His understanding of Scripture, which is quite plain, by the way, from Judges 11, his understanding of the principles that come from Genesis 22 would make most of us look silly. He is an in incredible Bible student, this man Jephthah. We'll see all of that coming out of a brief consideration of Judges chapter 11. Now just going to our chart. Here he is. His work has to do with, of course, the, the death of Christ here. He's rejected by his brethren. So we see that he is a type of Christ rejected by his brethren. But really, his main work is up here. At the time of Armageddon and just prior, you'll see, because that's when Christ will send out Elijah to begin the work of the recovery of scattered Israel right through the millennium, of course, to the end. So he's a type of Christ as a redeemer and a deliverer in that period. So let's have a look. Now, what I'm going to do for the sake of time is to, is to basically just use summaries. And then I'm going to direct you to a few things. We simply can't do this verse by verse. It's impossible in the time allotted. 
we'd need four or five sessions to do it properly. So we're just going to give you a summary and I'm going to highlight certain things out of the record and it will hopefully make sense. So let's have a look at Jephthah as a type of Christ. As a, type, as a type of Christ's first advent and his rejection by Israel first of all. Now we saw in chapter 11 verse 1 that he was conceived out of marriage, outside of marriage. Christ was born of a virgin and you are familiar with the record of Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph, being an upright man, was going to put Mary away privily because he suspected that she was carrying a child outside of marriage and it wasn't his, he knew that. So our Lord Jesus Christ was later on accused of being born of fornication, remember? John chapter 8 verse 43. We be not born of fornication, they said to him. Just like David, I believe, had some problems. He too had that problem. I won't go into that now. Gilead's wife bare him sons, we read in, in Judges 11 verse 2. And Yahweh's wife, Israel, whom he married at Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, and he calls her that in Jeremiah 3, verses 14 and 20. She's still his wife, by the way. She's been outside of his house for 2,700 years, but he's, he's still married to Israel. We know that from Jeremiah 3, 14. Yahweh's wife bare him sons, namely the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Jews of Christ's day. Through envy and jealousy, Jephthah's brethren cast him out, verse 2. For envy, Christ's brethren rejected and crucified him. We are told in many places, Mark 15, 10, amongst them. Jephthah, Jephthah fled to Tob, goodness and fruitfulness is the meaning of the name, and gathered to himself the despised of this world, the empty men of Judges 11 and verse 3. Christ ascended to heaven and the foolish, the weak and the despised of the world gathered unto him. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 26 to 29. So you see how this is unfolding? Jephthah is a type of the rejected deliverer of Israel. Now let's move on to the next phase. A type of Christ's acceptance by Israel at his second advent. In distress from an unprovoked invasion by Ammon, whose name means tribal, that is, a people as a congregated unit, read the development of Nebuchadnezzar's image, the bringing together of all of these peoples into a congregated unit, Israel under duress call upon Jephthah to deliver them. That's the message of chapter 11, verse 4. Look at verse 4. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Israel made war against Israel and so they cry out for deliverance. Israel under attack by the Gogian host will cry to Yahweh for help. We know that from Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15 because they will be largely defeated when they get to this point of desperation. You know, the IDF, the Israel Defence Force, which of course is not a standing army, it's an army of civilians, people off the street, has had an incredible record, has it not? It began in 1948 and 49 with the War of Independence. It achieved, of course, world review, rave reviews in the events of 1956 and the Sinai campaign. In 1967, the Six Day War, they still talk about that. Oh yes, there was a bit of a dent in their reputation in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. But the IDF has an astounding record. Well, they're going to be savagely torn to shreds by the Russian forces that will come down upon the land. And in their absolute desperation, they will call upon their God. Hosea 5.15. That's going to happen. And it's prefigured here in the type in Judges chapter 11. Jephthah agrees to be Israel's head and captain only if Yahweh gives him victory over Ammon. Now there's a little change you need to make in your Bibles here, if you have the authorised translation. I want you to come down to verse 8. Maybe verse 7. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead who have come to him in their desperation, they've said in verse 6, Come and be our captain, that we may fight against the children of Ammon. And he replies, Did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why have you come to me now? when you're in distress. 
And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now. That's, that's not an answer, is it? These people, they're, they're apoplectic. They've got no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Well, therefore we've come to you. That's not an answer. But they go on to say this in verse 8. That thou mayest go with, with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now look what he says in verse 9 in response. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, <coughs> If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and Yahweh deliver them before me, the AB says, Shall I be your head and puts a question mark on the end of the verse? You can cross the question mark out. It's not in the Hebrew. It's not a question. It's a statement. And what you've got to do is change two words around in order. Because you see, the word at the end of verse 9, shall, should be after the word I. And it should read this way. If Yahweh delivers them before me, then I shall be your head. So he's saying, brothers and sisters, it will only be if God gives deliverance through him that he will agree to be their head. Because that will be the divine imprimatur, that he is in fact God's chosen deliverer for Israel. And they need to see that. And when our Lord Jesus Christ redeems Israel in the events of Armageddon, when two-thirds of the Jews in the land probably most of the atheists, will perish. Those rem that remnant that comes to him, they will want to make him head and captain. But the, the fact is that he will have earned that title by the victory that will have been wrought over their enemies. That's the basis on which he will, he will be their king. Because God has given him that victory. And Christ will claim the throne of David and rulership over the world by divine authority and power. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 9 is very clear about that. We'd love to go back and read that, but you can have a follow-up yourself. Psalm chapter 2, 6 to 9. So let's move on. We're going to try and cover this section pretty quickly. This is the this is sort of like the bulk of the chapter, the negotiations with the with the king of Ammon. Jephthah defeats Ammon after fruitless negotiations. Now, those negotiations go on from, from verse 12 uh, right through to verse 28. And we just want to summarise what this is really all about. Christ will defeat Gog and all nations who refuse to submit to his ultimatum. And he will make an ultimatum after Armageddon. So there will be a long period of negotiation. In fact, ten years after Armageddon, there's going to be a lot of negotiation because the saints will go out and they will, they will put demands on the nations. The demands, of course, of Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Fear God and keep his commandments because the hour of judgment has come. That will be the message that the saints take out. Well, what we have here, of course, is that, that part of the type. Now, when you go into this record from verse 12 onwards, and you have, you've got all this information, by the way, in the booklet that was given to you, so you can follow up on it. This is the disputed territory that the negotiations um, uh, are over. The king of Ammon claims land from Arnon to Jabbok after 300 years of non-possession. So here's the river Arnon, the Wadi Arnon. Israel had gone right around. They skirted right around Moab, and they'd come through here, and they defeated, of course, um, a, a couple of kings. The form, this was the former kingdom of Sihon the Amorite, this shaded area. And it had once belonged, portion of it had belonged to Moab and portion of it had belonged to Ammon. Now the king of Moab is saying, I want it back. And Jephthah says, no, you can't have it back. I'm going to give you the reasons. And you know what he does, brothers and sisters? He gives an astonishing exposition of the history drawn from the Pentateuch. He was clearly a student of the writings of Moses. It's quite astonishing what he does. He recounts the historical facts and he gives four unanswerable reasons. And when you do a study of this, you will see that Jephthah was indeed a Bible student. He knew his Bible backwards. 
It's as simple as that. So then, what are his four unanswerable reasons? We just want to summarise these very quickly. So we're going to do this hop, skip and a jump, right? Right to the end of the chapter, basically. We just have to do that. In verse 17, he quotes from Numbers 20, verse 1. In beginning his incontrovertible case against the claims of the king of Ammon. In verses 19 to 22, it's almost verbatim from Numbers 21, verses 21 to 25. And the four reasons advanced by Jephthah are these. Now you can pick these up if you look at Judges chapter 11, verse 21, for example. Towards the end of the verse it says, So Israel possessed. Now that word possessed gives you your key. The issue here is possession. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. Moab, you didn't own that land when we came and conquered it from Sihon, the king of the Amorites. He didn't own it when Israel claimed it. So possession, the rights of conquest, is his first unanswerable rejoinder. The next one is power. If you come down and have a look at verse 24, Wilt thou not possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever Yahweh our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. In other words, the strength of national deities. The issue of power. Who gave that land to Israel when they came through there under Joshua, Moses and Joshua? Well, of course it was Yahweh. Who did they defeat? Well, they defeated the Amorites. Who's got? Was that? Well, that was Chemosh. So there was this contest between national gods and Yahweh won in a Akanda. The next issue was acquiescence. If you come down and have a look. Verse 25. And now art thou any better than Balak, the, king, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Or did he ever fight against them? So he goes back to one of the king of Moab's progenitors and says, well, the king of Moab, when we came through here 300 years ago, he didn't bother with it. He didn't lay any claims on the land. He stood back. He acquiesced. True. Unanswerable. There's no answer for this stuff. And then finally, the fourth time, the lapse of all claims, verse 26. While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aroah and her towns and in all the cities that, that be along by the coast of Arnon, 300 years. Why therefore did you not recover them within that time? You know, there's such a thing, isn't there, as the statute of limitations. That applies in modern law today. There's a statute of limitations. Come on, 300 years? You see, Four unanswerable rejoinders. This is a very intelligent man. He's a very good debater. And the reason he's a good debater is because he knows his Bible. He knows his history. He knows what the Bible says. So that is the way that he sweeps aside the claims of the king of Ammon. But now we come, brothers and sisters, to this touchy matter. I want to just take you through, this is extremely important to get Jephthah's vow right. I'm going to lead into it from verse 29. Then the spirit of Yahweh came upon Jephthah and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh and passed over Mizpah of Gilead and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. When you read that verse, what impression do you get? The impression I get, and Gar's quite right in what he's, he's pointing with his fingers, it's like skipping on the hills. This is like spirit movement, isn't it? <coughs> Look at it. I mean, he's got a family. He's got a multitude of people with him. We know that you can't move them very quickly. Jacob said to Esau, don't push the people, you'll kill them all. See? So you can't move a multitude quickly. He's coming back from the land of Tob to come back to where he belonged to, in Gilead. But the record doesn't read that way, does it? The record says in verse 29 that the spirit of Yahweh came upon Jephthah and that word came upon is Hayar, it means to exist. So he becomes a spirit man, so to speak. And he passed over Gilead and he passed over Mizpah and he passed over to the children of Ammon. 
It's almost like spirit movement, like Christ of the saints, isn't it? Going through the wilderness to arrive at the Mount of Olives. That's the time. That's what we're reading about here. Now, what about his vow? Well, that comes in verse 30 and 31. But you know what happens? Jephthah's vow, when people discuss this, they always discuss verse 31. Very, very few people even bother referring to verse 30. You know what? You will never, ever understand Jephthah's vow unless you get verse 30 sorted out first. Let me talk, tell you why. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto Yahweh. Now I want you to notice what it says. This is not a vow unto any false god. It's a vow unto Yahweh. Now if we're dealing with an intelligent Bible student, then he knows all about vows, their importance. He's not going to make any stupid vow. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he said, and here are the important words. These are the words you have to underline in your Bible. If thou shalt without fail, without fail, deliver the children of Ammon into my hands. That, you're going to see, is critical to what follows in verse 31. But I want to just give you a summary, first of all, of the facts about Jephthah's vow. He intended a human sacrifice but left the choice to God. You know, when you read there in verse 31, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth, that could be an animal, couldn't it? Look at the Hebrew. Not used of an animal. It should read whosoever. So he intended a human sacrifice. His vow fell under the law of devoted things, as you're going to see in a moment. And it wasn't until the 12th century AD, two millennia after the events, that there was any debate at all about the fate of Jephthah's daughter. 1200 AD, that's when the debate started. Josephus records that Jephthah sacrificed his daughter. Now Josephus, of course, is not always right, but he was just recording what he heard in the history of the Jewish nation. Rabbi Kimchi invented the theory that she was dedicated to the tabernacle service. And that's why the translators have put a few things in here that confuse people. You know, they, they put in, for example, when you go to verse 40 of Judges 11, it says that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah, which is quite a good translation, by the way, four days in a year. In the margin of my Bible, they, they say that they went to talk with Jephthah's daughter. Well, I mean, that's just ridiculous. The Hebrew word's got nothing to do with talking with anyone. So that's the kind of thing that, that translators and others have tried to put in to, to try and soften what they think is the blow. The AV margin for verse 40 is quite incorrect. So let's come and look at this vow. As we pointed out, he comes as a spirit man. He passes over with the movement of the spirit. He knew the irreversible law of vows of Numbers 30. You don't make vows and then go back on them, brothers and sisters. God doesn't like fools who vow and do not keep. And so when he uses the words without fail, he introduces an element that's crucial to the basis of his vow. But just think about that for a while. If you're going to go out to deliver Israel like Jephthah was, and you ask God for an ironclad guarantee that there is absolutely no possibility of any failure, then you, are, you must be in a position to offer whatever is required for that to be achieved. True? And he knew exactly what was required. I'm going to show you where he knew it from. Whosoever. It was human, but not specified. He left the choice to God. There were many options. And then he says this in verse 31. When I return to, in peace from the children of Ammon, that whosoever shall surely be Yahweh's, and I will offer not it, it should read him. I will offer him up as a burnt offering 
an ascending sacrifice. Now, where's he getting that from, do you think? I'll offer him up as a burnt offering. Well, I want to show you where he's getting it from. He's getting it from Abraham, brothers and sisters. You know, you hear people say, but God doesn't accept human sacrifice. What nonsense. What absolute nonsense that is. Because in about a half an hour's time, we're going to be sitting down to remember a human sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, this rubbish about God not accepting human sacrifice, of course God abhors human sacrifice to false gods. But he calls upon his own people to make human sacrifice, including Abraham. And he said to Abraham, you take your only son whom you love and you take him to the very place where I am going to offer my son as a human sacrifice and you make him a burnt offering unto me and Abraham couldn't wait to get there he rose up early in the morning and three days it took him to get there Isaac was dead for three days because Abraham fully intended to offer him up as a burnt offering and Yahweh had to step in and stop him did Abraham have any problem with making human sacrifices? Of course not. And neither did God. And that's why he calls upon us to be human sacrifices of a sort. That we might, as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, offer up ourselves as living sacrifices unto God. That's a human sacrifice of a sort, isn't it? Total dedication. To the will of our God? Yes. So let's not be deterred by that kind of rubbish. Let's see what the scripture has to say. Let's see why it was that he did what he did. You've got to move on. I'll come back to the point of Abraham in a moment. I want you to come to Leviticus 27. <coughs> now I've had quite a few discussions, as you can imagine, on this matter. And up to the point that we've reached in this court, the people with whom I've been discussing have not always been convinced. But when you quote this verse, it's all over, Father shouting. All over. This is number, Leviticus, sorry, 27, verses 28 and 29. If you have a look at the head of the chapter, the heading of the chapter, it says the redemption of vows and of things devoted. And verse 28 says this. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto Yahweh of all that he hath, and that's the important phrase, you can't offer someone else's, you've got to offer your own, of all that he hath, both of man. Now look the word up, it's Adam. Both of Adam and beast and of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto Yahweh. None devoted, which shall be devoted of men, Adam, shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. So here's the answer to human sacrifice. Jephthah's vow fell under the provisions of the law of devoted things. It only applied to all that belonged to a man, and the word devoted here, kerem, means something cut off or separated that is given to Yahweh with no right of redemption. And verse 29 is rendered by Rotherham as touching anyone devoted who may be devoted from among men, and that's a good translation, from among men he shall not be ransomed. He must surely be put to death. You make up your own mind on that one. So the law made provision for what Jephthah did. So why did he do it? Well, we get the answer in verse 34 of Judges chapter 11. Why did he make a vow like that? 
Well, he goes out, he defeats the Ammonites. Verse 32, 33. He passed over, verse 32, to the children of Ammon. Yahweh delivers them into his hands at the end of verse 32. And then he comes home. Verse 34. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dancers, and she was his only child, because beside her he had neither son nor daughter. Now that word only child, the word child not there in the, in the text. This is the word Yaqib. It means an only one. She was his only one. Now brothers and sisters, there are some very, very important words in the Old Testament and this is one of them. It only occurs 12 times, this word Yaqib. The first three occurrences are in Genesis 22. Take thy son, thine only one, and offer him up for a burnt sacrifice on one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. And twice more in the chapter, Genesis 22, that word Yuki is used. You'll find it in verse 2, in verse 12, and verse 16 of Genesis 22. The next occurrence is this one here, in Judges 11, verse 34. You will find it in Psalm 22, verse 20 the messianic psalm about the sufferings of Christ. And you will find the final of the 12 occurrences in Zechariah chapter 12. And to that one I want to take you. Zechariah 12. Now this is how this word is used. And look at the context. Zechariah 12 is about Armageddon and the immediate aftermath. And we read this in verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, it means acceptance, and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now I'll stop there. This is Yahweh speaking. When the surviving Jews after Armageddon come to Christ, God says... They will look upon me, whom they pierced. Well, they didn't pierce God. But yes, they did. Because they pierced his only one. And Yaqeen means united. One. A father and son who are absolutely one. So when they pierce the son, they pierce the father. That's what that's saying. Because father and son are locked together. You cannot separate them. You want proof of that? Have a look at Genesis 22 verse 19. Do it in your own time. You know what it says? That Abraham went back to where he came from after the sacrifice of Isaac. He went back to Beersheba. And the two men that came with him. There's absolutely no mention of Isaac in that verse. No mention of Isaac. But there is the word Yachad. Which is the root of Yaqid. They went both of them, together, they were one. No mention of Isaac, because he's one with his father. That's the word that's used of Jephthah's daughter. Only occurs 12 times in the Old Testament. But read on in Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And they shall mourn for him. So they pierced God, but they'll mourn for him, the one they actually did pierce as one mourner for his only son. You can cross the word son out. The word only is this word, your key, for an only one. And shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. There is the word, your key. And this, brothers and sisters, is why Jephthah made the vow he made. You know why he made it? Well, because he understood the story of Genesis 22. Now, I haven't taken you back there. I should do that, but I'm looking at the clock. I haven't taken you back to Genesis 22. But you know the story, so I can tell you, and you'll pick it up. You know what happens? In Genesis 22, the seventh promise that God makes to Abraham, he swears by himself. He sevens himself. In the, in the Hebrew, Shabbat, to seven himself. And he says, Surely, in blessing, I will bless thee. In other words, he's saying to Abraham, oh, you, I couldn't ask any more from you than what you've done. 
I mean, I've asked you to sacrifice your own son and you willingly did it because you knew I'd have to raise him from the dead. You can't do any more than that. You're in the kingdom, Abraham. And Paul picks this up in Hebrews, doesn't he? And he says that God swore by himself that by two immutable things, we might have certainty. What were those two immutable things? The fact that he exists and the fact that he swore by himself. That guarantees it. It's going to happen. He's saying to Abraham, the promises made to you, Abraham, are now beyond doubt. They are going to happen. They're unconditional. Unconditional. You'll be in the kingdom, Abraham, without fail. I just added those words. You'll be in the kingdom, Abraham, without fail. Because I'm going to offer my son. Because you gave yours, I'm going to offer my son. That's why you're going to be there without fail. So when Jephthah makes a vow and asks God to deliver the Ammonites into his hand to redeem Israel without fail, he is so spiritually intelligent that he's not prepared to make that request without saying to God, I know the cost. And I know the cost from Genesis 22. Deliverance without fail means that I have to be prepared, like Abraham and like Yahweh, to give my only one. Now, he doesn't particularly want God to do that, but he's saying, I understand. And that's why the vow's made. Got it? What an unbelievable character he is. But you know who's almost superior to him in a way? His daughter. You have a look with me at Judges 11. He was an only child. As we've pointed out, the promises to Abraham were made unconditional in Genesis 22. Yahweh will fulfill them without fail, and Abraham's seed will possess the gate of his enemies. To accomplish this, Yahweh had to provide his only begotten son, the ultimate sacrifice. That's the principle of Jephthah's vow. Now let's have a look at what happens here, brothers and sisters. Abraham and Isaac are mirrored by Jephthah and his daughter and both point to Yahweh and his son. So there's another little type that's presented here within the type. We know that Jephthah's a type of Christ, but now you can take another step and you see Jephthah like Yahweh, like Abraham represented Yahweh in Genesis 22, and his daughter as a type of Christ. So it's another little cameo presented to us of the greatness of this man's vow. These only ones cooperated fully with their father in a work of redemption without fail. They died to fulfill the will of their father. They were not personally worthy of the kind of death that they suffered. Like Christ, Jephthah's daughter was totally submissive to her father's will because Israel's redemption depended on it. And she knew that. And that's what we read here in verse 35. And it came to pass when he saw her that he read his clothes and said... Thou hast brought me very low. I understood the price, but now I've got to pay it. Now, what, thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto Yahweh, and I cannot go back. That's true of all vows, by the way. And she said unto him, Look at the words, brothers and sisters. Look at these words. My father. My father. The word if is not there. She's now learned about the vow. Thou hast opened thy mouth unto Yahweh. Do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as Yahweh hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Israel. What? What a girl she is. Would you like a daughter like that? Hey? prepared to do whatever her father 
said because it has to do with the redemption of this road. Unbelievable. So here's the summary. After defeating the invading forces, Jephthah returns home and fulfills his vow by offering up his only child, a virgin daughter. After the defeat of Gog, Christ will dedicate the refined third of Judah, the virgin daughter of Zion, to Yahweh as a whole burnt offering. Can't go into the details of that now. Jephthah's daughter spent two months in mourning before being offered, and the refined third of Judah will mourn bitterly in houses apart before their final acceptance by Yahweh. So brothers and sisters, that's the story of Jephthah's daughter. We're going to pick up some of the threads of that and go into chapter 12 because while chapter 11 deals with the redemption of Israel in the land, chapter 12 verses 1 to 8 deals with the redemption of Israel outside the land. We're going to see that in our exhortation this morning. God willing.